We're starting off with Titus. We've had two weeks in Titus now, a few weeks still to go. And so we're going to pick it up, uh, finish Titus chapter 1 today. And uh, so far, we've looked at uh, the greeting from Paul to Titus. It was kind of like a son to him, like a spiritual son, spiritual child, someone who he had invested in and poured his life into and loved like his own son. Uh, so we saw a bit of a, um, an introduction uh, with some deep and rich theological truths, even just in the greeting. And then we saw last week, Harold helped us look at, look at um, the, some of the purpose of the letter. So why was he writing? Paul had left Titus in Crete, where Paul was from, so this island in the middle of the Mediterranean called Crete, still there today. <clears throat> and uh, he left them there to establish some churches. And so he said, this is what it looks like to be a, not just a leader, but an, an elder, a particular kind of leader in the church. And so I want to pick it up from there, where we, where we kind of picked it up last week, uh, but then keep going through to finish the chapter because it's one continual thought. Paul's writing this letter. He's not writing like a... a um, a theological document where he's uh, like, a, like a systematic theology where he's saying, and now about this particular topic, and now about this particular topic, he's writing it like a letter to someone who's like a son to him. And so um, it's hard to kind of just abstract little bits out from other bits. We don't want to do that actually when we read scripture. We want to read it in its context, understand who is it being written to, what's happening uh, in that particular place, in that particular time, how does it actually help us understand what was being written? And then we want to do the work of applying it contextually to our lives today. So that's, that's where we're going to pick it up in verse 5, even though today we're really going to be looking at verse 10 and following. This is Paul. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, and as I directed you, to appoint elders in every town. An elder must be blameless, husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's house, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, hold, holding to the faithful messages taught so that he will be able to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. That's what we looked at last week. Now we're picking up this week. Four... Or the reason you need to do this is because there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It's necessary to silence them. They're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of their, own, one of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Shabam! This testimony is true. Paul says, well, for this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure. If you ever wondered where that saying comes from, this is where. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him with their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. There are some striking words in this passage of Scripture. So we want to do the work of understanding what, what is Paul saying to his spiritual son, Titus? Why is it in Scripture still? And what does it mean for us today? So let's ask God to help us and we'll get stuck into it. And so, Father, please help us in our hearing and in our doing the work now uh, to Gain understanding for sure of, uh, of this passage of Scripture, why uh, you inspired it by a spirit, why Paul wrote it, what it meant and what it means for us today. Uh, please help us, Father. We don't want to just be uh, puffed up in knowledge. We want to grow into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen. And so uh, last week we heard about the qualifications for a particular role of overseer or elder, the qualifications, why, why it's so uh, necessary. And this week we're looking at uh, basically why we need to have um, solid leadership in our churches. It's not just restricted to, not, not just restricted to like that role of, of elder, though the elders obviously have a particular responsibility in the church. 
uh, to do the, the kinds of things that we read in, uh, in this passage of Scripture. Um, but the, the contrast is really important. It's contrasting good and godly leadership with some of the people who are in Crete who are operating against the gospel specifically for their own power and their own financial gain. And so uh, maybe for you, like certainly for me, what stands out the most as I read through this passage of Scripture, just these six verses, is where Paul says of the Cretans, he says, they are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And you might go, man, that's a hard word, right? <clears throat> if someone said that of you, like to your face, you, you'd probably and rightly feel fairly confronted and even offended. Or if someone wrote that about, say, Australians, Said Australians, they lie all the time. Evil beasts, lazy gluttons. You think, oh, they haven't, like, they're being funny, right? Because it's so outrageously sharp to say that. Paul's actually quoting someone from Crete. He's quoting a Cretan philosopher from a few hundred years earlier who said this exact thing. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts. Lazy philosophers. It is a strong take, but what's Paul doing here? Paul actually does this kind of thing a lot. Not necessarily speaking harshly, though. He, he, does, he doesn't pull punches, <clears throat> in his writing at least. What's he doing? He is, <coughs> excuse me, he's quoting the same philosopher, actually, that he quotes in Athens. He quotes this philosopher, Epimenides. Uh, you may recall when he is in Athens, he sees this altar to the unknown God, uh, and, he, and he starts speaking about this God. He's quoting this guy, uh, Epimenides, who, who says something about Zeus. He says that in Zeus, we live and move and have our being, and Paul kind of co-ops that, and he says that of God. So actually, the God you don't know is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Paul did this often, uh, Paul's really good at taking or speaking into the myths of the cultures in which he is traveling and, and trying to communicate the gospel. And he goes into a bunch of different cultures, actually. There's one kind of, I guess, overarching culture, but then there are specific cultures wherever he goes. And so he takes what he sees in the culture, he exegetes the culture, he understands the culture, he sees what, what are there kind of underlying myths and values, and he speaks into them, but he also borrows them and repurposes them for the gospel. When I say myths, I'm not talking about like, when, the way we usually use the word myth these days is to talk about some sort of like fairy tale or a legend or something that didn't happen or untrue. Uh, but when, when I say myth, and even when scripture says myth, I'm really talking about that more in that technical term of uh, a culture's deeply held, like foundational beliefs about themselves and the stories that get them there. Whether the stories really happened or ostensibly happened or perhaps they didn't happen or perhaps they've been embellished, uh, either kind of way, when we're talking about myth in this sense, we're talking about the things that we hold to be true about ourselves as a culture. For example, Aussies, we are a laid-back people, aren't we? We're laid back, uh, but we're also battlers, also willing to put in the hard work, like the hard yards, yeah? Ready to lend a hand, support the underdog, give a mate a go, I true blue. Um, we like to believe that myth about ourselves, even though uh, we're probably much more like the Christians, and now we're we're, we are, as a people, quite lazy. Let's call it efficient. We're an efficient people. The least amount of work for the most amount of scene to be working. We love our long weekends. Uh, we have a bunch of myths about ourselves. Anzac Day, you know, Anzac Cove, Dakota Track. This is, these are the kind of the pillars, the, the myths. Again, they happened, right? I'm not using it in, a, in the language of fairy tales. I mean, the myths as in those cultural stories and understandings that we build our cultural identity upon. Paul is really good at, at finding these myths 
and not just speaking into them, but co-opting them. In fact, Scripture does this over and over and over again. The, the biblical authors do this all the time, right from the very beginning of the Bible that we see this happening all the time. Scripture's full of speaking into culture, using the stories and myths of that culture to show the truth, the truth in that cultural understanding or the truth in that myth, uh, the lack in it as well, and how the truth of God's good news is so much better. So one challenge that I hear sometimes, used to hear it more often than, than these days, uh, but people would say things like, well, what about all those, like there's a creation story that predates the biblical creation account. There's a flood story, Gilgamesh, that predates the biblical um, story of the flood. And therefore, obviously, the Bible is just plagiarizing other you know, Mesopotamian stories and cultural myths and things like this. And it's often presented as a gotcha, like, see? See? Uh, obviously wrong. That's not, that's not what's going on. Uh, the Bible is consistent. The scripture writers are consistent in this, in seeing what is the current cultural framework or understanding of the way things are. Let's start there. You have this creation account. Let me tell you what's true of that creation account what's false in it, and why the good news of who God is and what he's done is so much better. Here's this flood account, you believe. Let me tell you what really happened. Well, let me tell you how uh, the truth of that is so much better. In effect, Scripture is good at saying over and over and over again, and Paul does this really well, if you hold this to be true, let me help you to understand what is true, what is false, and what that means. Uh, so in like Psalm 104, it says, Yahweh, not Baal, is the storm rider. So the cultural understanding was Baal is the storm rider. And David comes and says, no, 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 not, not Baal, it's Yahweh. Or as I-25, Mot, he's this God uh, in the area. Uh, he is the God of death and he was a devourer. And then what does Isaiah say? Well, Yahweh swallows up death. And so often through scripture, Jesus does this all the time. You heard it said, but I tell you, this is your understanding. <clears throat> Let me help you to understand the truth of that, what's lacking or false in it, and why the gospel, why the kingdom, uh, why God's truth is so much better. Over and over and over again in Scripture, we see this happening. Paul does this again. Uh, it goes to Athens. Here is a, an altar to the unknown God. Let me tell you about this unknown God. You have an understanding of Zeus? As the, as the chief God above every God? Actually, let me co-opt that language and tell you it's actually Jesus is the name above all names. He is the God that stands above every God. He, his is the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Understanding culture, taking what is known, contrasting it with the character and the works of God to show why God and his gospel are for everyone and why his truth is so much better. It's wonderful, actually. This is what Paul's doing here, speaking into the culture, using the culture, even using the culture's own philosophers. Our philosophers today, probably, probably our philosophers in Australian culture context would be our musicians, our comedians, possibly our politicians, Definitely our comedians and musicians, maybe actors, sporting stars, people who are good at one thing. We think they must be good at this other thing. Uh, and Paul gives us a, an example of how to speak into culture using culture. Not just, not just saying, well, you guys, you guys got it wrong. Uh, let me tell you why. He's not adversarial. He goes in there and says, oh, man, you guys... You're so close, but you are also so far. Let's do some work in understanding how the truth of the gospel and the God, like the king of the kingdom, is so much better. So these Christians had a reputation for hundreds of years that people of that island had had a reputation. That reputation persists. I remember as a kid watching like Bugs Bunny movies and they still use the word Cretan as an insult. It's a reputation that's lasted for millennia. 
And Paul is just basically saying, yeah, even your own philosophers identify you're a tricky kind of people. So man, if the culture that surrounds you seeps into the church, it's over. He's trying to warn Titus that the church needs a leadership, not just elders, but needs strong leaders, people who will stand up, who won't be adversarial to culture and just hold culture at arm's length and kind of retreat and just go our own way, but rather in the midst of culture, not synchronize with culture in a way that lets the culture into the church. We, uh, the Australian church has been really bad at this over the last 40, 50 years. What happened was uh, the church basically established or helped establish the culture in Australia. For a hundred years, in Adelaide especially, we were known as the city of churches. There, there was revival, if you like, <clears throat> a move of God so strong that they, had to, they could not keep up uh, with the number of people becoming Christians or Christians coming here um, seeking refuge from religious persecution, couldn't build churches fast enough to house people. That's how kind of central Christianity was to the culture. And so we set the culture and we became accustomed to being in step with the culture because we set the culture. And then what happened was the culture started to change. And what did the church do? The church went, well, we're, we're, we're with the culture. And so the church just went and drifted with the culture. Exactly what Paul is warning Titus about on this island of Crete. So you've got to be sure. And so what does he warn them? He warns them of rebellious people, so those who refuse the authority of Jesus and the Scriptures and their brothers and sisters because we are subject to one another. Not to lord over each other, not to be the boss. We're subject to each other so that we can spur one another on to love and to good works. But he says these people were rebellious. They didn't have Jesus as their Lord and their King. Didn't submit to Scripture. Said they were full of empty talk in verse 10. So they can say things that sound meaningful, sound good, sound pithy, but are actually vapor. There's no, no substance to them. Or even just outright deception, he says. So things that will lead people away from the truth. And he identifies especially those from the circumcision party. These are the people who are trying to get Christians to not just trust in the grace of Jesus and the love of Jesus for their salvation, but to trust in their own works that have to add to the gospel, their own works for salvation. Heaping uh, guilt and shame and like laborious effort upon people to try to work their way to Jesus. It says they're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. So instead of preaching freedom in Jesus, they're preaching, uh, you need to listen to me and do what I say and do these works, otherwise you will not get to Jesus and give me money and I'll help you do it. These people are like the anti-elders. These are the contrast that you see. With the elders that are there to serve sacrificially to build people up, to, to be strong even when it's costly. And then here are these anti-elders. They don't love the flock. They want to use the flock for their own gain. They're kind of, they're, they're, they need a group of people under them so that they can move higher. They don't love and submit to Jesus they want to conform Jesus to themselves. They're preaching a Jesus, a version of Jesus, but it's a version of Jesus that leads to their glorification, to their lining of their own pockets, to their power, to conformity to them. So they want to conform Jesus to themselves, not to conform themselves to Jesus, so that they can conform other people to themselves and not to Jesus. It's about control, about money. Paul says they need to be silenced, not by threats. He's not saying... <laughs> Like, it's not, uh, it's not that kind of, they need to be silenced. Uh, he's saying, through better proclamation of the truth, showing them and their listeners their false message to be foolishness. That's how we need to silence those kinds of people, not by 
cancelling them, not by like deplatforming them, not by uh, anything other than a better proclamation of the better message, which is the truth. We can't let a false gospel go unchallenged by the truth in the church. So Paul's imploring to Titus. So man, if there's a false gospel, you must challenge that false gospel. He's specifically saying we are not a community that says, doesn't matter what you believe. Go for it. So that, to a 2023 Australian ear, that sounds like, that sounds like grace. That sounds like love. That sounds like tolerance. Or you believe whatever you want to believe. Uh, to the king of the kingdom, he says, that's, a, that's unloving. You're saying to someone, oh, yeah, sure, be unmoored from the truth. Go for it. What parent would ever want that for their kids? Oh, sure, just go for it. Whatever you want to do. Follow your heart. Wherever it leads, even to death, go for it. No, we can't. We can't be that kind of community because it does matter. Confront- confrontation can be kindness. Paul is explicitly saying we need, man, some things are so destructive they must be confronted. So this is when Paul mentions some in the culture uh, were lazy, gluttonous liars. Uh, and like we said before, I'll put it to you, our, our culture, although we like to think of ourselves, we have this myth of us being really hard workers. And just like these are generalizations, so it's probable that not every single person in Crete was an evil, lazy liar, although they probably had all lied, just like, oh, you guys are probably all lied, and me too. Uh, but generally true of the culture. I'd say it's generally true that we have a lazy culture, and even when we work hard, it's to secure our comfort. We work hard to secure our ease. And so the goal of us, even if we are not lazy in achieving it, a goal is to be Lazy, in a sense. Uh, Polybius wrote of the Christians, he says, the Christians on account of their innate avarice, this is another philosopher from back in the day, live in a perpetual state of private quarrel and public feud and civil strife. You hardly find anywhere characters more tricky and deceitful than those of Crete. Money so highly valued among them that its possession is not only thought of to be necessary, but highly creditable. And in fact, greed and avarice are so native to the soil in Crete that they are the only people in the world among whom no stigma attaches to any sort of gain, whatever. So this is the culture, again, that Paul is writing into, that they've planted churches in. They're trying to establish the strength and the health of the faith in those communities. And this is why Paul says, for this reason, because that culture is like this, we need to rebuke sharply. Bring correction. Don't let people who say they belong to Jesus continue in the way of blending in with the surrounding culture. Don't let people continue to listen to false teaching which doesn't just distract but leads to destruction. He says, show them the truth. Contrast the culture with the character of Jesus and with his gospel. Show them why Jesus is so much better. Not to bring shame on those people, not to lord it over them, not to beat them down with his intellectual or theological superiority, not to, not to stand over them with you know, his moral superiority, not for any kind of gain at all, but he, he says why. He says, so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. Confrontation can be kindness. I'm not saying that we just go, you know, all right, let's... Let's get, uh, let's get our confrontation on. But that we would be the kinds of people who would so love somebody that we would go and stand in the way when they're running to death, destruction, or danger. That's the kind of people that Paul is saying to Titus that both he needs to be and we need to establish in the church so that they may be sound in the faith. This word sound denotes health. The spirit 
through Paul, wants us to have a healthy faith, not a diseased or gangrenous faith. Like, sure, I've got a leg and it's there, but it's being eaten away by something. So it will be unusable and needs to be cut off. He says, no, don't, don't be okay with a faith like that. Or don't be okay with a community like that. Cut out the gangrene. Bring correction. Show them the way so they can live as Christ, even in a hostile culture, so that they grow into maturity and aren't tossed to and fro by any new teaching or anyone that sounds like they know what they're talking about, but really their words are vaporous. A goal is to be a community who love Jesus and his ways, proclaim him and live them. That's our goal, actually, as a community. And we're not, we're not like we looked at last week, we, we do not want to be a legalistic people who are, are burdening ourselves with rules that are not found in Scripture. We're not trying to work our way up to Jesus. We're not trying to earn our salvation in any sense, in any way. We can't do that. That would be foolishness. That's one of the very things that Paul is writing against. But we are a people who have a Savior who is also our Lord. And he's our Savior, really, to the degree that he's our Lord. Those two things come together. If he's not our Lord, he's not our Savior. And we we want to be subject to the King. His ways are perfect. His ways are just. He loves us. We saw this two weeks ago. He knows everything. And what he does is works for our good. We can trust him. One last contrast to finish the chapter. He says, To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So again, real, well-known verse. And you might think, to yourself, I mean, this has, been a, this has been a very misused verse also, uh, or a misunderstood kind of verse. What is he saying? He's saying, to those who are pure, you have these Jewish people coming in with their false teaching and their myths saying, you cannot be a Christian and eat bacon. You can't be a Christian Unless you get circumcised, fellas. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. To the pure, everything's pure. To the pure, Christians, when you're in Christ, go ahead and eat bacon. It means if you're in Christ, there's liberty in things like commu- uh, consuming alcohol or not, in celebrating holidays or not, in eating meat or abstaining, in being circumcised or not. So actually that. There is freedom in these kinds of things. And even when you fail or fall or sin, there's forgiveness and freedom from all sin, which isn't then license to go and sin and go, well, great, that, uh, if all my sins are forgiven, let's just go and sin. You say, no, no, that would be foolishness too. It means freedom in Christ. To the pure, all things are pure. It means if you're in Christ, you, like Paul says elsewhere, all things are permissible. Not everything's helpful. Blanchard writes uh, this word, this Greek word, uh, katharos, is a word used of soiled clothing that had been washed clean. It's pure. Grain from which all chaff had been removed. It's totally cleansed. Metal without any trace of alloy or a man with all his bills and taxes paid. Barclay says it's this word uh, also used of an army with which had been purified from any cowardly or undisciplined soldiers, nothing left but first-class fighting men. Catharsis. That's where we get our word catharsis from. Like to expel all of the bad feelings, and now you just feel great. Jesus in the Beatitudes, blessed are the catharsis in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. James writes, this is katharos, an undefiled religion. This is what pure religion is in the sight of our God and Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So we're in the world, can't help that. We're actually, we're called out from the world and then sent into the world. So we're here for, to be in the world, but not to be of the world, not to sync up with the world, not to blend in with the culture around us. 
But, Paul contrasts this again, he says, those who abandon the gospel for comfort or selfish gain, they are not catharos. He says, in fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. It's quite a contrast. Defiled meaning to be polluted, the opposite of healthy from before. It's the healthy leg versus the gangrenous leg. There can be a lot of knowledge, a lot of spiritual sounding talk, even loving sounding doctrine or pulling from culture, culture's understanding of love and instead of showing where it's good, where it's false and why the love of God is so much better, just adopting a cultural understanding of love and then proclaiming that as if that's what Jesus is saying. It's defiled. They've jettisoned the gospel and the king of the kingdom and they deny him by their works. It says they're disobedient and unfit for every good work. Every work is stained. Even food that the Jewish people would say is okay to eat. Even that is eaten in an unworthy manner, is what he's saying. To the pure, everything is pure. But to the defiled, everything is defiled. Adokimos is this word, used to describe a counterfeit coin that fell below the standard weight. It was worthless money. The word's also used uh, of, again, it's the opposite of catharsis, uh, any kind of metal with impure alloys in it or corrupting or impure elements. Adokimos is used to describe a cowardly soldier who failed the test in the hour of battle. Seemed great in training, but when it actually came time to defend their fellow soldiers, family, territory, they proved cowardly. Or also described a candidate for office who is the citizens regarded as a useless kind of person. You know, look great on the outside, but no substance. For these people, Paul is writing... He's saying that Jesus isn't their Lord, so he's not their saviour. He's saying you can see it in their works. Their disobedience shows their unbelief. Their beliefs lead to their activity and actions. So profession should lead to practice. He says, but you see it in their practice. They're after dishonest gain. You see it in their practice. They're leading people away. You see it in their practice. They speak really well, lovely sounding things that actually leading people away from the truth of the gospel. We've got to be on guard that we don't become these kinds of lazy, gluttonous people who twist the gospel for our own ease, comfort, conflict avoidance or selfish gain because it's really easy to become those kinds of people. We look at other churches and church movements and even denominations who, with culture, have slid very far from the gospel. I'm not by any means saying we're the only ones waving the gospel flag. There are many, many great churches in our city and in our country and and in the world. Uh, There are also many who have stayed tethered to culture as culture has drifted from the gospel and have gone right along with it. And as they do, the rest of the culture say, well, now we have this contrast. These guys are just like us. They seem really lovely and lovely and lovely, lovely and loving. But you, you also claim to be Christian, but now you just seem like really backward and bigoted and full of hate. So it's harder because we're not just standing in contrast to culture. We're standing in contrast to people who claim Christ and are in contrast to the gospel. But just because the work's hard doesn't mean we don't need to do it. It's easy to blend in with the culture. It's costly, costly to grow and maintain a healthy faith, a pure faith. Rather, we want to be in community so that we can be corrected when we stray so that we can do the loving and difficult work of 
correcting or rebuking. This is not, again, confrontation is not unloving. It can be. It can be done, and it can be done in an unloving way. Uh, but it's not necessarily unloving. In fact, confrontation can be the most singularly most loving thing you can do to somebody, depending on their direction and velocity. It's difficult work, but it's essential work. We also need to ensure that our walk matches our talk, that we say what we believe and live as we say, and then be the kind of community that encourages one another, spurs one another on to love and to good works. Uh, next week, we, we have... Uh, Next week's basically part two of this week, which was part two of last week. I mean, it's, again, it's one letter. We're going to look at some specific applications of this, which <laughs> may be controversial uh, for some, but again, I hope will be, I hope will be very, very helpful. Uh, feel free to read ahead. Uh, for now, let's pray and ask God to help us live what we've just heard. Father, we need your help as always. We need your Holy Spirit. Uh, we need each other. And we need each other f- full of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to be the kinds of rebellious people who um, come out from underneath your Lordship. You are our King. You're our Savior. You, you are our Lord. We are gladly known as your people. We want to be um, conformed to your likeness. So help us. We want to be subject to your scriptures as well. Help us to understand how you'd have us live, how you'd have us act and think and relate to you and to one another. And again, Father, we need your spirit to do this as well. Help us. Help us to love one another with the same kind of love that Jesus has for us. By the love, all people would know that we belong to you. And also by the love, we can help one another to not synchronize with culture, to not uh, go chasing after foolish myths, to not succumb to false teaching. But Father, help us to be, be the people who example what it looks like to pursue purity and pure doctrine. Uh, Help us to be the kind of people that are open to a rebuke from a brother or a sister in love and that we would be bold and loving enough to bring that rebuke in love uh, with the words you give us um, when our brother or sister strays or succumbs to false teaching or foolish myths. Lord, help us to be people who uh, can exegete the culture around us, can understand the world in which we live, Help people to understand what of that is good and echoes of your goodness and your your, uh, creation. Help us to speak helpfully and winsomely uh, what is false and unhelpful. And Father, help us to bring you glory with our lives, both exampling after Jesus and speaking uh, into culture why the truth of Jesus and his gospel is so much better. And we pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen.